Welcome back to Project Lowball, my Pokemon challenge series where I take on every major fight in the base games with only one Pokemon, no bag items used, no cheats, no RNG manipulation, and all while trying to find the lowest to level possible for each battle. This challenge is open-ended, meaning you, the viewer at home, can also attempt this and leave your findings in the comments below to help perfect this project. Last episode, we demolished Pokemon Emerald using immunities, cheesy setup, and lots of Ninjask and Shedinja. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video to see what improvements were made thanks to all the comments in the last video. And of course, if you haven't watched already, go check out the last video to see where we started off. Now without further delay, our journey in Sinnoh will begin shortly. We start our journey exactly the same as an Emerald, staring down a level 12 Geodude. But the one clear difference being we're without any sort of super effective grass or water type. Instead, we're going band for band, rock for rock even, with Orberg City's gym leader, Rourke. Meet Lucky7, the Geodude. At level 7, with perfect attack stats, you're probably lucky if you only need 7 rock smashes to get through the opposing Geodude, hence the nickname. Fun fact, the winning attempt you're seeing on screen also happened to be my 7th attempt with this Geodude. The plan is simple. Defense girl to max defense, hopefully dodging any crits or early damage via a miss, and then chipping through Rourke's rock type team with ease. We do teach rock throw as a contingency plan, but in this attempt, we never really needed it. I narrowed down to level 7 for this attempt due to no Pokemon being available at this point knowing damaging water or grass types moves. If you're curious, the earliest you can get either Absorb or Water Gun is level 9, and Machop, which is available in Orberg Gate, is pretty underwhelming at best. While I did attempt this challenge with a level 6 Geodude, it simply wasn't successful as you either took too much damage or simply did not have enough damage output to get through the entire fight. Overall, with level 7 being the lowest I could find and definitely being the right Pokemon for the job, I'm going to start off this video with a strong grade of confirmed, as this seems to be the lowest level setup available. On to the second gym leader, we face off against Gardenia, the grass type leader. With Gardenia, she has somewhat of a passive team, relying a lot more on defense, draining moves, and a bit of utility, rather than raw power, which is pretty predictable for a grass type team. Thankfully, the perfect counter is just over yonder in the Eterna Forest, Beautifly. With 4 times resistance to grass and maxed out special attack for a bit more oomph, Beautifly can stand its ground with gust spam all the way to the finish line. No other moves required. And no, I did not forget to nickname the Beautifly again, I just ran out of characters. The full nickname was, make sure to subscribe, the videos are only getting higher quality from here, and I'd love to hit a thousand subscribers off my second video in this project. So I went with subscribe, for short naturally. There is surprisingly some RNG in this fight, as sunny day turns can slow you down when facing Cherim, but overall this fight is not much more than pretty much spamming the A button till Roserade drops. I did find a few other viable setups with a lot of different Pokemon actually, but with them being to either tied for level 13 or struggling to even complete at level 14, Beautifly is the most consistent Pokemon I have for Gardenia, while also being the lowest level, leading me to a comfortable confirmed grade for Sinnoh's second gym. In Pokemon Platinum, the gym order is slightly altered, putting Fantina in the third gym instead of her former slot as the fifth gym leader, like in Diamond and Pearl. I couldn't tell you if this was for progression purposes, as you get to Heart Home City first, 
or to be in line with the anime where Ash takes on Fantina as the third gym leader. But what I can tell you is she does not stand up to one of the rarest Pokemon you can find in Sinnoh, Heracross. Heracross comes fully loaded with an insane attack stat, learning Night Slash as a base move and the Guts ability. Because of the Guts ability, I'm able to use Duskull's moves to my advantage and purposely bait a Will-O-Wisp, which burns me, activating Heracross's Guts ability. If you don't know already, Guts gives me a one and a half times multiplier to my attack. And with my HP investments, Haunter's AI is actually dissuaded from attacking and goes for the Confuse Ray. This is my second bait, where now I break the confusion with my Person Berry. Getting that exact sequence is half the battle, but the true RNG check lies in Fantina's ace, Miss Magius. Not only do we have a chance to faint to Psybeam, we need Night Slash to crit to get the clean KO and secure the gym badge. I would say this entire sequence happens about 5% of the time, which isn't the most consistent, so I'm hesitant to grade this anything beyond a confident, for now. Now we move on to Maylene, the fighting type leader. And hey, 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 before you go and write an angry comment, Spiritomb is not a legendary and can be bred just like any other Pokemon. And if you already knew that, make sure to leave a comment telling me that you're already aware, and I'm gonna leave a reply telling you how smart you are, because you deserve it. Moving on. Spiritomb is Sinnoh's version of Sableye, being a dark and ghost type, but it has even better stats and arguably a much better move pool for a challenge like Low Ball. Maylene's Pokemon can only hit me with Rock Tomb, and in Lucario's case, Metal Claw as well. With full defense investments, we mostly ignore the damage and take out the first two Pokemon with ease. Three Shadow Sneaks completely KOs Metatite, giving us enough XP to ding level 19, giving us access to the move Dream Eater. When paired with Hypnosis, we can safely spam Dream Eater on Machoke and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lucario. In this attempt, we are lucky enough to get a crit to finish off Lucario with ease and skip another mischance from Hypnosis. But, if you're trying these setups at home, I would recommend playing around a turn 3 wake up from Lucario and going for another Hypnosis, unless you're really desperate. It tends to be a more consistent strategy overall. With Spiritomb being level 18 in this fight, being considerably lower than where I started with Maylene, I would see this as being not only very hard to tie, but even almost impossible to beat. So today, Spiritomb walks away with a nice confirmed grade. Game Freak should really stop putting powerful ghost types before fighting type gym leaders. All true Pokemon fans know that Bidoof, not Arceus, is the true god of all Pokemon. And by extension, Babaro, its evolution, is the ultimate specimen. And in this case, Crasher Wake's Face of Doom. Meet our Babaro, a movable. This Babaro was specifically bred and designed to crush Crasher Wake. With its patented simple ability, alongside the Grass Knot TM we earned from Gardenia, alongside the Thunderbolt and Rest TMs we earned from the Game Corner, nothing can break this beaver. For those unacquainted, simple doubles stat raises, but also doubles stat decreases. This means that Gyarados' Intimidate reduced Barbaro's attack by two stages instead of just one, but Defense Girl raises Barbaro's defense by two stages as well. Pair that with Leftovers, the God Beaver shrugs off most attacks, and utilizes its surprising TM pool to heal turn a Pokemon you probably didn't expect to even see in a run like this. Now, you might have just asked me where I got leftovers, an item that you usually don't see until the end game, and you can actually get them even before the second gym. If you're lucky enough to get the right trainer ID when you start a new save of Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, or Platinum, you will actually have a 1% chance to yield a Munchlax encounter on 4 out of all 23 honey trees. These Munchlaxes are always holding leftovers. So for any of you viewers trying this challenge at home, make sure to include leftovers in your theory crafting.
oh yeah, this is a confident grade, as in theory I might be able to shave a level off, but regardless, Babaro is the mon for the job. Alright, one question before we start this next fight. Who let Byron open gym with his team? Hmm? Even though his team got a considerable buff in Platinum, Byron is still one of the weakest gym leaders we've ever seen in the number 6 spot. With only 3 Pokemon, and his ace being one of the worst fossil Pokemon, Bastiodon, Byron was a really easy fight to solve. Thankfully, in the Platinum rendition of his team, he's even weaker to fighting types as a whole. So naturally, we run it back with Guts Heracross. Yes, Guts Heracross again. In this attempt, I get really lucky and dodge Magneton's Metal Sound, but my EVs are set up in a way so I have a decent chance to live Steelix's Flash Cannon, even with my lowered special defense. This also usually leaves me with enough HP to eat the Sandstorm tick as well as the Burn tick, and once Bastion comes out, of course, it's a clean one-hit KO, which will immediately end the battle. Now, it would be really hard to optimize this battle further, as the lower level I go, the more I need to take out of my defense EVs to invest into speed, so at this moment, this setup is completely confirmed. As most of you watching know, Ice is one of the most notoriously weak defensive types in all of Pokemon. While there are plenty of ways for you to abuse Ice types, Candice's gym does not make it easy. Between her Sneasel lead and her Ace Frostlass in the back, it does put some bumps in the road. With Sneasel being fast and strong, setting up with a weaker Pokemon is not much of an option. And with a Pokemon like Frostlass in the back, sporting a fighting type immunity and extra evasion in hail, it's not as simple as it seems. Houndoom not only offers a great base special attack and good amounts of speed, it also has passable enough defenses to face tank Candace's Sneasler. With full defensive investments, nasty plot via egg move, and a flamethrower TM from the game corner, we can easily set up and scorch Candace's team. But there's one catch. Like I mentioned previously, Frostlass has the ability Snow Cloak, which gives it an evasion boost, so you do have a chance to get KO'd by Blizzard if you miss after she sets up a double team, giving you a roughly 66% chance to connect. Otherwise, the setup and the fight is really clean, and with no leads elsewhere, this is an easy confirmed grade. While playing through Platinum, I've been really surprised at how much the team changes alongside the AI improvements have made all the testing for this challenge demand a lot more of a balanced approach. But yet again have I cooked a setup that brought an 8th gym leader to their knees. While strong leads are a really common theme in Platinum, Volkner's Jolteon does not fit that bill, with its pretty poor attack stat and redundant moves like Quick Attack and Iron Tail. I realize this is prime setup fodder for none other than Quagsire. If Quagsire could evolve any sooner, I would do this fight at that level. With Quagsire, you can freely set up to the max with Curse, which he learns from breeding, and while in this attempt I use Dig, a mini spoiler is I got no real use of the Earthquake TM this run, so feel free to use it on your Quagsire if you do attempt this gym at home. Honestly, there's not much else to say. Quagsire sits up to max defense, max attack, and also max special defense through amnesia, face tanks everything, dodges any potential crits, and just obliterates his team with seemingly no effort at all. Obviously, this setup isn't easy confirmed as I can't make Quagsire a lower level, and this setup can even be further improved with Earthquake or giving Quagsire leftovers, as you can tell, Quagsire just obliterates this gym. If you're enjoying the video so far, consider dropping a like, and make sure to stick around to the very end of the video, 
as I do have a massive update on the Pokemon Emerald Challenge that you won't want to miss. Now, with every gym badge obtained, all we have left in our way is the Elite Four and one of the strongest champions in Pokemon history, Cynthia. Our first challenge is the one and only Bug-type Elite Four, Aaron. Aaron's Yenmega is yet another example of how a strong lead puts a lot of limitations on a challenge like this. Yenmega gets really dangerous really quick, with double team boosting its evasion, strong same type moves, and the pivoting move U-turn, which outside of raw trial and error is very hard to predict correctly. Thankfully, Yanmega spares us on the U-turn shenanigans and lets us set up for free, which is a curse and a blessing. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's talk about Magnazone. Magnazone, being introduced in Gen 4, has some of the most defense available in this level bracket, and the right typing to not get completely murked by Yanmega. Magnazone has an easy time against Vespaquen, and if lucky, Yanmega as well. I bring Hidden Power Flying to deal with the Mega Threat Heracross, and Magnazone's base special attack is enough to get us over the finish line with Thunderbolts. Now, it is very possible for a Yanmega to end your whole run by just having too much evasion and dodging most of your moves, leaving you with not enough power to get through the finish line, but in this attempt, I am lucky enough to get through the Yanmega, hitting most of my moves, and immediately, you will then face off against Heracross. Sporting close combat, Heracross will still do nearly a third of your HP, even at max defense. Thankfully, Close Combat does reduce his own defense and special defense, and after tanking two of them, we are more than able to KO cleanly with the Hidden Power flying. With Heracross out of the way, the rest of the fight is not nearly as scary. Caesar or Drapion can only really tickle you as they don't know any super effective moves, and you just use up the rest of your Thunderbolts to slowly take them out. Now, while I am confident Magnazone is the mon for this challenge, there might be some potential to shave off a level, either with, again, adding leftovers, or maybe some slight tweaks in Magnazone's move pool, or Magnazone's EVs, and just seeing how much that influences the AI's decisions, and if we have a new way to capitalize on that. Regardless, one Elite Four down, three to go, and then a champion. Whew. Before I commentate this fight, I have to say I'm very happy that a lot of Sinnoh Pokemon got to shine in the Elite Four of all places, as my setup for Bertha is one of my favorite evolutions, Leafeon. With Curse, Seed Bomb, Double Team, and of course, Rest, this setup is tailor-made to actually minimize all the variants on Bertha's team. Here's how. While Double Team is usually associated as Cheese, being a staple of evasion, luck-based strategies, I actually run it here on Leafeon to try and dodge a few common problems that this setup ran into. First, being the special defense drops from Whiskash's Earth Power, which it loves to spam on you. Once your special defense does drop, it is very likely that it will hit you out of range or abuse you while you're on your rest turns. Secondly, Double Team reduces the chance to fall victim to Gliscor's Elemental Fang moves. While Leafeon can handle a flinch, one bad freeze will mean you have to reset. Double Team does allow me to have more time to not only set up Curse on Gliscor, but spend less turns healing up on Whiskash's Earth Powers and other strong moves. This is the same reasoning we have a Chestoberry equipped, as you will want the extra two turns early game to help set up quicker, 
or take out Whiskash earlier than I even do here, if the situation demands it. Now, once you get past the Gliscor, the rest of Bertha's team just can't even touch you. Pair that with Leafeon being at the lowest level it can evolve at 30, I am grading this setup as confirmed. We are now on to the third Elite Four, Flint. And I have to preface that in all my attempts, most water types were just flat out terrible. They either required way too many levels to get good moves, had terrible special defense and therefore couldn't withstand Houndoom, or just the endless sunny day and solar beam spam getting in their way. So I went back to the honey trees, and I raised my very own Snorlax, named after my cat, Lexington, who is also pretty much a Snorlax. For this setup, Lexington the Snorlax has mixed defenses, tailored to not only face tank Houndoom, but set up and not get immediately murked by Infernape or Flareon. This setup can be a bit tricky, as while you do have leftovers ticking at all times, if you get flinched turn 1 or 2, it's likely a reset. You will also notice in this attempt I stall an extra turn so that I can KO Houndoom while the sun expires. Houndoom will always reset up Sunny Day, so make sure to time your turns perfectly to not give Infernape a Sunned Flare Blitz. While it doesn't do noticeably more damage than a Mach Punch, if it does happen to crit you, you'll probably get fainted flat out. But if Sun's not up when Infernape comes out, you will be able to live a Mach Punch crit and still potentially clinch a victory. Once you get past the very scary Infernape, it's actually a pretty breezy fight. Flareon comes out and will always Will-O-Wisp you, as long as you're out of KO range, which if you manage the sun turns properly, you should be. And that of course means an easy rest, and then clearing out Flareon to bring in the final two Pokemon. Now Rapidash and Magmortar, I can't explain their AI. They'll set up sun and just click Solar Beam on you, regardless of the fact that you're at max special defense. This is probably just because the AI is coded to heavily prioritize weather moves in the appropriate weather, but my headcanon is Flint is just excited to use Solar Beam and Sun, and he's already given up after watching you set up for five turns in a row. Now the reason I have Snorlax at level 32 and not lower is that even if I can set up safely on Houndoom at a lower level, the Infernape damage is honestly just too much to handle, and I do rely on forcing of that potion turn to stay healthy via leftovers. As far as I'm aware, this setup is confirmed. Honestly, Lucian was actually a really hard fight to theorycraft for. You have Mr. Mime who sets up screens, insane base speeds across the entire roster, and mixed damage, coverage. There really is no easy solution to this fight. You do not have access to a calm mind. Most Pokemon that learn amnesia either don't have the right moves to take care of the rest of Lucian's team, or can't withstand the raw power and coverage that Lucian has. So at a glance, there's no easy solution to this fight. Except Drapion. Evolving at level 40, with access to the double dance setup of Agility and Swords Dance, boosting speed and power, Drapion easily ignores the Thunderbolt damage from Mr. Mime and crushes the fast, yet very fragile psychic types, even through the Reflect. Well, you might think, that's great, you found the solution. But remember, the challenge at hand is to find the lowest possible level for each fight. And level 40 is a pretty poor showing on my part. I did consider running it back with maybe Snorlax or one of the other mods I used very recently, but Gallade put a hard stop to those plans and other dark types or ghost types do not withstand the raw damage output of the rest of Lucian's team. Put me in this catch 22.
considering all these factors and the level 40 setup that I used for this fight, the obvious grade here is skeptical. Can Snorlax do it? I don't know. My testing did not go well at all. But regardless, the fight's over, and it's time for the real challenge. Cynthia. Cynthia is one of the most infamous champions in Pokemon history. Even if you've never touched the Sinnoh games, you've heard about her and her Garchomp. Or worse, ran into her in the black and white post game. In Platinum, we can be thankful for a few less raw levels in exchange for more balanced movesets, but regardless, the Spiritomb Leech shuts down a lot of potential setup options. Now, I'm going to say two words, and tell me if it jogs any stressful memories from Pokemon Showdown. Clefable, Cosmic Power. If yes, it's exactly the set you think it is. If no, meet the setup queen, Cosmic Power Clefable. With such limited distribution of the move and access to more setup moves like Charge Beam, Clefable is one of the most notorious cheese mons in competitive singles history. And today, it's going to cheese Cynthia. Due to Spiritomb's ability pressure, all my attacking moves take two PP instead of one. Because of that, unless I get a Charge Beam boost three times in a row, with each boost being at 70% chance, it's actually better for me to stall Spiritomb out, as we can safely tank Spiritomb's crits from anything that's just not Dark Pulse. Once Spiritomb finally faints from struggling, we immediately are faced with Cynthia's Lucario, with a strong Aura Sphere that will end the run in just one crit. Using the rest of our Charge Beam on Lucario, we get that up to max special attack alongside max defenses, and still have just enough charge beams to eventually confront Melodic. Lucario does go down, and in his wake, we see Togekiss, who also knows Aura Sphere. Togekiss gets immediately taken out by Ice Beam, and thankfully, it's the sign that we're now halfway there. Navigating the second half of the Cynthia fight does not get much easier. While Garchomp is yet another crit check with the scary yet inaccurate Dragon Rush and very strong Earthquakes, the true gatekeeper between us and the Hall of Fame is Cynthia's Melodic. After we've committed 50 turns of stalling, setting up, and healing, you have a coin flip war with Melodic. But I think I found a way to play around this coin flip war. Now, of course, in a perfect world with no critical hits, you can simply stall Melodic out and have just one Ice Beam left for a Roserade. But ultimately, that's very unrealistic, and Melodic's AI gives us some insights on potentially when and why it uses Miracote. From all my testing, Melodic never uses Miracote twice, and only seems to use it after seeing a special attack. With this logic, you can actually play around the Miracote by going for a Charge Beam and then camping on either Rest or Cosmic Power, which will trick the AI. My testing of the AI was admittedly a low sample size, so I could be wrong here, but it does line up with what I know about the AI in the earlier Pokemon games. Because you're taking every second turn to stall or heal, you should theoretically be at full, if not very close to full HP, once Roserade comes out. Now, you have one last RNG check in front of you. If Roserade happens to go for a Sludge Bomb, and it crits, there are exactly three damage rolls which kill you. So, with that being a about 1% chance to happen, 
we thankfully dodge it and one ice beam finishes the job. And we claim our rightful place as the champion of Sinnoh, using only the lowest level Pokemon we can find. But of course, there's always a post-game boss. Now, this video obviously isn't a game review, but I personally found the Platinum postgame to be admittedly a bit underwhelming. I understand that, similar to Pokemon Emerald, a lot of the improvements we see are throughout the full game, but Stark Mountain is kinda lame. While you do get access to four legendaries before the Elite Four, being Giratina and the Lake Trio, this postgame unlocks only the Gen 1 Birds and, of course, Heatran. That's it. All of the legendaries are locked behind requirements we can't meet, or they're behind events. So our options for the post game are not as broad as you may think. Also, did you know that to get access to the true end game form of full strength berry, you have to defeat the Elite Four 20 times? And berry is apparently only available on the weekends? Did berry get a full time job? Anyways. As we all know, your rival's team changes depending on the Pokemon you pick at the very start of the game. So, it only felt fitting that I had a setup for each rival iteration. Thankfully, Zapdos works if you pick Chimchar or Piplup. Now let's start this off. This Zapdos setup entirely relies on getting the 10% Omni Boost from Ancient Power. You can probably get away with going for a second chance at the boost if turn 1 doesn't work out, but the boost is key to winning this fight. Once Barry Staraptor goes down, immediately Empoleon will jump out and threaten you with Ice Beam. If this is the Piplup starter team, you're likely to see Torterra and its Stone Edge instead. Either way, just use the appropriate super effective move, and between Leftovers procs, the defensive boosts, and Roost, most of the fight should be a breeze. The only real threat for this Zapdos is a Stone Edge crit from Heracross. Otherwise, roosting when you get to almost half HP and choosing the right move is all this fight requires. As you probably have already seen, I got hilariously lucky on fighting Empoleon with the Paralysis as well as the crit, but with the Omni Boost you are comfortably faster than Barry's team and can simply roost up on the Ice Beams or after taking out the Empoleon. You might also want to consider a neutral nature on your Zapdos if you are going against Torterra, as the attack decrease from Bolt can cause some issues if you're relying on the fly damage. For now, these two renditions of Barry I can grade as confident, as I had a hard time finding setup mods that do not get completely walled by Empoleon, or flat out obliterated by the Star Aptor leaf. Now, if you picked Turtwig, you instead get Barry's Infernate team which is a lot stronger and a lot faster, but easier to abuse with double setup. Turn 1 Staraptor will always U-turn out into Roserade if you lead with Slowbro. Hence, you see me use Amnesia turn 1. It's absolutely necessary. While Roserade does have a very strong base special attack, it simply isn't enough to break through Amnesia boosts without a full crit. This lets you set up all your curses for free and get plenty of time for your leftovers to heal you to full during the Grass Whistle turns. And yes, Roserade will spam Grass Whistle until it completely runs out. So you're getting plenty of value through leftovers. Now, don't get too worried if Shadow Ball drops special defense as you don't even need high special defense for the rest of the fight. The only risk you'll be running is Sludge Bomb poisoning you, which is very unlikely unless you've wasted a lot of turns being asleep, and Roserade is now forced to sludge bomb you as it has no other options. If you happen to be in this very rare scenario, there is a chance you will have to reset due to sludge bomb poisoning you. But in most scenarios, you will simply just curse seven times to account for the attack decrease from Staraptor's Intimidate, and begin to destroy Barry's team one by one. Like the nickname suggests, crits are scary, Heracross has Mega Horn, which has an increased critical hit ratio, and Snorlax, critting you with its crunch, is likely to force you to reset if you're not at full HP. Overall, while this setup definitely works, I'm confident maybe a level or three levels can get shaved off, but it is dicey. If you do run out of Zen Headbutts, you're probably screwed. 
And for that same reason, this setup does not work into Barry's other team, as Empoleon alone needs a minimum of five Zen headbutts to take down. Minimum. But we've done it. We found two Pokemon that handle all three iterations of Barry's level 80 team. Before we conclude the video, can you think of a better setup? If you stuck around this long, thank you for watching the video to completion. These videos take a lot of hours, and I always want people to get the most out of the videos I make. Before updating you on the Pokemon Emerald setups, I have a question for you. Do you want to see something like a spreadsheet that tracks all the setups I've used, and then compare them to the better setups found by the community or myself right next to it? Or do you want the spreadsheet and a Discord server for everyone to connect and collaborate and find better solutions together? If so, comment below, as I think either options would be a great reference material and in a really amazing way to help push this project further. Now, on the topic of my last video, taking on Pokemon Emerald, first off I have to say, the support and the enthusiasm was immense, and as of right now, the video has comfortably passed 30,000 views, 1,000 likes, and almost 250 comments. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for participating in my project idea. Believe me, I never expected to take off this hard. But because the support is so immense, there was literally too many setups and ideas to try and fit into one tiny outro segment. So instead, I will be making a true sequel to the Emerald video, including all updated setups and some other retries as well, as well as exploring new mechanics that I mostly ignored in the last game and just almost completely retrying it. Obviously this is a win-win as I get more time to properly test and record and you all get another video. Of course, thanks for watching and go check out my first video if you haven't. It would be awesome if you could subscribe to get me to that 1000 subscriber goal if of course you enjoyed this video. I also have a coffee in the description, Ko-Fi, however you pronounce it, if you have disposable income and like what I do, consider supporting a small creator. Until next time, Paladin signing off.